Uh, today we're going to talk about personal prayer. Uh, last week we spoke about corporal prayer, praying in, in group. Uh, and that's important, but personal prayer is super important. I don't think that um, you could have a relationship with God without praying to God. How are you going to have a relationship with your wife and never speak to your wife? Same thing with this. How are you going to have a relationship with God and you never speak to God? That's what it is. Prayer is a dialogue between you and God. Um, but there is something that pastors uh, usually get this uh, question. And it, 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 little, it just hurts my, my heart a little bit when I heard this. It's good, but I wish it could be something else. And the question is this. Pastor, can you pray for me? God listens to you. He won't listen to me. Now, usually they don't say the second part. I just added that a little bit for flavor. A little sazon. You know? But they say pray for me. And that's good. We want the elders of the church to pray for us. That's awesome. But usually, you know, after you speak to people and you talk, it's, they're asking you for things that they could be praying themselves for. And it seems like uh, in their mind, it's like exactly what I said before. God listens to you. He does not listen to me. If you put yourself in my shoes, this is what I hear. Pastor, pray for me. You're close to God, but I'm really, 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 really far. And that's sad. You should not be far from God. But if you are, or if you feel that way, something's going on. Why do you feel that God is not listening to, to you? Why do you feel as if your prayers are not being answered? Maybe they're not. But why? What's going on? And believe me, I don't, I'm not more special than you. It's not because I have a title of pastor. Now I access a different level. It's not like, hey, God now, hey, Pastor Daniel, now you have special access to something that nobody else has. No, it doesn't work that way. I struggle as well. I have also sinned and I also need the grace of God upon my life. I need his forgiveness. Just like everybody else. I'm not more special than it. I go through life situations too. I also lost my job. If that goes through, sometimes we look at the bank account and it's not all there. So it's like, well, how come? You're a pastor. You should have a lot. No, we also go through struggles. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we should be going through struggles. So why are my prayers uh, not being answered or heard by God? What's the issue? And the issue is there's a problem in your heart. There's a problem in my heart. And that's what I want to talk about today. The other pastors that are going to preach today, Pastor Sandra and Pastor Exiga, they have a fire word for, for us. But what I want to talk to you is about your heart today. And we're going to read this in Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 25. If we were on the old times, I would hear the Bible go, and when the noise stops, I would know that everybody has it. But today we're in the uh, times of cell phones, so it should be even quicker, so you should have it, all right? So let's read. Verse, uh, verse 22 says, Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith. Said to the person next to you, Have faith. Have faith. If you're in your house, you can say to your children, to your husband, if you're by yourself, scream to it to me, Have faith. <laughs> I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. And it will happen. But you, but you must really believe it. Believe it will happen. And have not doubt in your heart. This is a word that we all use. I, 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 I'm guilty of this. We come here and do the transition where in a powerful moment of like prayer of God. And you know, especially in the charismatic and Pentecostal circles. Yeah, tell the mountain move and the mountain moves. And tell to the river and the sea to speak open up and walk and we walk in dry land we do that all the time have you guys ever heard me saying that those that didn't answer either you're not here or you're lying <laughs> i use that phrase all the time it's good it hypes everybody up it makes us believe and have faith and that's what we're trying to do and it's good to speak to the mountain to move 
Verse 24 says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. Say anything. anything. What's anything mean? We're not going into the Greek or the Hebrew or... It's New Testament, so it's Greek. We're not going into that. But in English, anything means anything. If it doesn't exist, pray for it. God will make it appear because he has the power to be creative. He created the earth. He created you. Man, this pastor's preaching something weird today. <laughs> and if you believe that you received it, it's past tense. It's already been given to you. It will be yours. This is the words of Jesus. It's not something I'm making up. And then we stop right here. We don't read the following verse. The following verse we don't like. This is what you'll never hear being said. Verse 25 says, but when you're praying. First word, what is it? But. Mm -mm. If the verse starts like that, warning, 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 warning. Something that we don't like is about to happen. It says, but when you pray first. What does it say? First. Forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. So that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. See, this is why when we speak to the mountain, nothing happens. We hold in a grudge in our hearts. This is why when we say to the problem, problem move, nothing happens. We hold in a grudge in our hearts. We have unforgiveness in our heart. This is why we go to the pastors. Pastor, please pray for me. God listens to you. He doesn't listen to me. You understand where I'm going? Unforgiveness is held in the heart. Romans chapter 10 verse 10. 10. It says, For it is believing in your heart that you're made right with God. Where do you need to believe? Where do you need to have your faith? How could there be faith and how can you believe in your heart if what's in your heart is unforgiveness? Sorry to be mean today to you, but I'm going to give you the word of God even if it offends you. I'd rather offend you all the way to heaven than all the way to hell. Matthew 15, 18. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Guard your Heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The heart is important. So your prayers have been heard by God. He does have an answer, but the reality is that you're holding unforgiveness in your heart. See, there can be two streams of water. There can be sweet waters and salt waters running out of the same river. It's either sweet or salt. It's either unforgiveness or it's either faith. You either believe or you hold unforgiveness. You can't have both in your heart. That's what Jesus said. You have unforgiveness instead of faith, instead of believing in your heart. In other words, your unforgiveness towards others is now allowing you to get the answer. It's now allowing the answer that God already has for you to come. You see, the Lord says, ask for anything, you already received it. So why don't we see it? It's because the unforgiveness on your heart. And it gets me to this point. And this happens all the time. And this is the part that I ask you for forgiveness. Don't hold a grudge against me. We always do two things. We either give justice or we give grace. You get to choose what you're going to do today. Questions for you guys. How many of you, and you can lift your hands. If you're home, you're good. Because if you're by yourself, you can lift your hands and nobody will see you. How many of you have been hurt by others? You can lift your hands. It's okay. Nobody's judging. How many of you have hurt others? When you hurt somebody else, was it intentional? You can lift your hand. No? Okay. One or two people. Thank you for your honesty. (laughs) 
When somebody else hurt you, was that intentional? Or do you feel like that was intentional? A lot of times we feel that way. But there, there's a problem. It's never us. It's always the other person that did it intentionally. We did it unintentionally. It was a mistake for us. But for them, it was a sin. <laughs> Condemnation for you. Repentance for you. But for me, it was a mistake. I'm really sorry. I really didn't mean to. This, this is how we are. This is me. I'm giving you this word now because, hey, look, it, 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 it's me first. The Lord spoke to me first on this. Yeah, it's a, that's the honest truth. It's always judgment for you and grace for me. Man. And then you have what we're living today. The era of social media. I'm saying this. My name is Daniel Santis. You can cancel me online after this. It's fine. But the reason you won't be able to is because I'm not on social media. So, ha, huh, <laughs> joke's on you. <laughs> YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We always have other people speaking about other ministers, speaking about other churches, slandering other people. Well, this happens all the time. All the time. But let me tell you something. What says here in John 16 verse 8, and when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin. Who will convict the world of its sin? Who will convict the world of its sin? So why are you pointing at everybody else? Our job is to preach the gospel, to say Jesus loves you with all your mistakes, with all the things that happened wrong, the, all the things that you did wrong, with all the sins that you did. Jesus loves you and he forgives you of your sin. But then, no, we want to convict, convict everybody. We have to point everybody else's sin, everybody else's mistakes. Look, when we point, we have one finger pointing and three fingers pointing back to us. So be careful what you do. How can we go into the presence of God when we're trying to do the job of the Holy Spirit? What do you think? You are God? Either you worship you or you worship Him. But I don't know about you. I'm going to worship Him. I can't be, you know, saying to somebody else, you did all this wrong. And if somebody else, if somebody does something wrong, the Bible says go in private doesn't say go on YouTube and Facebook and point to everybody else and Instagram and TikTok or whatever. Mark eleven twenty five 25 again says, but when you're praying, forgive anyone that you are holding a grudge against. I don't know about you, but I'm going to choose to give grace to others. I receive grace from God. I will extend grace to you. I don't want judgment to come upon my life, so I would not give judgment to you. But we tend to do this all the time in the church. All the time we do this. Let's just preach the gospel. Give grace. See, I'm going to tell you, the sign that you don't have a prayer life is that you give judgment and point everybody else's faults. Everybody else is a fault. That's a life of not prayer because you're in prayer. You would hold the standard that he is the standard. And the standard is that when he was on the cross, he said, forgive them because they do not know what they do. They're not, they don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. How can I not forgive you? He had the whole entire right not to do nothing for us. But yet he chose to give grace to us. Forgiveness is the key to personal prayer. We are not the standard. He is. And he forgave us. My question to you, and I leave you with this. What are you going to do today? Justice or grace? Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to welcome Pastor Sandra. Only when we abandon self and totally empty out ourselves. can we be filled with God's presence? Then you are going to begin to see Acts 1-8, the promise of power fulfilled in your life.
As his presence fills you, his power can begin to pour out of you. Does that make sense? No relationship, no anointing. Ooh, that's a mic drop. You, you can say that. Tell your neighbor, no relationship, no anointing. So what is the price for the power and the anointing? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Psalms 63, 1. David declares, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. So we see here that David had a glimpse of God's power and glory, and he expressed longing for it. But how was he going to get it? Tell your neighbor, there's a price and there's a dying. So David declares, I'm going to lay a foundation here. So David declares that his flesh, so for all the millennials and Gen Z, I'm coming for you. I want you just to pinch yourself. Pinch yourself real hard. So that is your flesh. All right? So he, his flesh longs for God while his soul, what's your soul? Your mind, your will and your emotions. So his soul thirsts for God. Isaiah says, in the night, my soul longs for you, O Lord. With my spirit, I will seek you. So here we have the flesh. Say, the flesh is longing. Our soul is thirsting. And our spirit is seeking. So here in Moses' tabernacle account, we find the outer court is symbolic of the flesh. The holy place is symbolic of your soul. And the holy of holies is symbolic of your spirit. So your flesh begins to long. You're in the outer court and your, your flesh begins to long. How, how many of you, I, I got to pray. It's like, I'm, I have this longing. I got to get in my prayer room. I have this craving. I need his presence. I need his touch. I need his love. I need fellowship with Jesus. That is the longing that the Holy Spirit begins to take you to in the outer court. And then the next phase is your soul. Your soul is thirsting. And that takes you to the holy place. Isaiah says, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And you will never, ever thirst again. My soul thirsts for the living God. And as the deer pants for the water, so my soul is panting. It's panting. It's panting. I'm thirsting. Thirsty. I've got to have more. And then all of a sudden, my spirit begins to seek. And it leads you, the Holy Spirit leads you to the Holy of Holies. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Psalms 105 says, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. And so, what does that look like? So, all of a sudden, you're going into your place, your secret place where you pray and you get on your knees and you begin, that's a place of struggle because you begin to say, God, I'm sorry for cutting off this guy. I'm sorry for cussing. I'm sorry for all the things that I do. What are you doing? You are repenting. You're getting your heart right. You're crucifying your flesh. You're trying to get rid of all the guilt, the shame, the failures, the attitudes, and then you give them a Santa Claus list of all your needs 
needs. That's the outer court. But can I tell you, when you feel like God is a million miles away in the outer court and you can't feel him and it seems like your prayers are hitting the ceiling and God, where are you? Do you even see me? Are you even listening, God? I can't feel you, God. Where are you? It's a temptation at that moment to say, that's it, I'm done. But can I tell you a secret that I learned many years ago? The longer that you are on your knees, the less of the flesh remains. There's a death. There's a dying to your flesh. And all of a sudden, when your flesh begins to die and God has dealt with the Isaacs and the attitudes and the sin of your heart, all of a sudden you're going to break through to the second stage that you're going to come into the holy place. And all of a sudden you feel the breakthrough. You know that you're in the presence of the Lord because all the guilt, it is gone. And you're able to worship. You're able to praise him you're speaking in tongues you're weeping you're crying you have entered into the holy place and you know Jesus is there but if you have not prayed for a long time or if you have not prayed consistently if your prayer life is all over the place in order for you to get to that breakthrough you're gonna have to keep crucifying your flesh Don't stop there. Let the Lord deal with your Isaacs, your attitudes, and the heart because your flesh must die. And just because you die today, Monday's waiting on you. Tuesday's waiting on you, but, but I got to work. Yeah, I got to work and I'm a single mom and you know, I've got children and you know, I got the housework and, um, I, there's just so many things. It's a temptation. The enemy's coming for you, and he wants you to stay in the outer court so that you don't experience your breakthrough. And he don't even want you to get to the outer court. But can I tell you that there's another place for you? So in the holy place, you're thirsting for him. You are thirsting, and you're receiving him. But then all of a sudden, the third stage holy of holies this is the place that you say nothing you do nothing you don't pray you are drinking him in you are receiving him deep calls to deep at the noise of your waterfalls as the waves of billows have gone over me listen there's a place that you can come into in the holy of holies That you are now drinking him. You are no longer concerned about you and your heart and what you're going through and what is happening in your life. You're saying, God, I need more of you. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for you, God. Show me your heart. Show me your heart, God. And all of a sudden, God begins to take you in layers. He begins to take you in deeper dimensions. He begins to take you to places and give you secrets that you would have not known in the outer court. Listen, there are some things that God wants to tell me, but he can't tell me here. It's only when I'm on my knees. I'm humbling myself. I'm emptying out my flesh and I'm saying, God, I'm desperate. I'm desperate for more of you that's when he begins to pour out his presence and his anointing and then when I get up oh I'm ready to pray for others I'm ready to do the father's will I'm ready to release the gifts that have been locked up inside of me with the Holy Spirit Pastor Michael Signorelli he's learned the secret back in our home We had nothing. Our house was infested with mice. I was a broken single mom. But he got a taste of the glory. And at 15 years old, before God sent him out to preach, before you see him do miracles, signs, and wonders, where would you see him in his bedroom? You would see him praying, seeking the face of God. 
And all of a sudden, when God called his name to go and preach and open up many doors, the Holy Spirit could trust him with the anointing and the presence of God because when no one knew his name, the Holy Spirit knew his name. So I'm here to tell you, no relationship, no anointing. No relationship, no power. Oh, everybody wants the mic. Everybody, oh, I, I'm called to preach. Oh, yeah? What's your prayer life look like? Oh, I want that mic. Oh, do you? Do you want to pay the price? There's a price for dying. There's a price for the breakthrough. There's a price for the anointing. And when I see Pastor Michael from 15 years old and now he is 40, you know what I see? I see a man that has never forgot what he learned. The power of crucifying his flesh. He lives in the holy of holies. And that's why you see him in conferences. That's why you see him building a church. That's why you see miracles, signs, and wonders. Because the Holy Spirit trusts him. The Holy Spirit knows his name. In the midnight hours, I dare you, when the Holy Spirit wakes up, will you pray? Oh, no, I'm too tired. I got to go to sleep. Oh, but I'm called to preach, though. Yeah. Come on. It's about that sacrifice. It's about that sacrifice. Oh, it was easy to get into the presence here this morning. Oh, we had the worship team. Oh, yeah, they be bowed it. Oh, it, it's so easy. But what about Monday? Oh, we got to go to work. We got to do this and that. Will you pay the price on your knees Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Because listen, your life, there's a purpose and a destiny written all over you. God's not playing with you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to hear your voice. And too many Christians sitting in this house... You've been staying at the outer court and that you don't go no further. Oh, I'm good. I'm saved. I'm good. Get out of here with that junk. We're going to go to the holy place where we receive our breakthrough. And then we're not going to stop. We're going to live in the holy of holies. Because there's some secrets that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you. There's some greater and deeper dimensions that he wants to take you to. There are levels that you haven't even experienced. And it's only when you die and pay the price will you see it. Wow, that was fire. Y'all better be taking notes. That was fuego. I'm going to throw some Spanish words because I know this is the service that we usually translate. And the first one that was Pastor Danny, that's my husband, just for your information, that's my husband. <laughs> hey, God is so good. God is moving in this place. I don't know about you, but I just want to thank our lead pastor for just extending up a room. This is a pray, a house that prays. We're seeing what God is doing through this house. We're seeing the live testimonies that are happening at the end, and it is so good. It's become like one of my favorite parts of the service where we get to hear what God is doing through the power of prayer. Today I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 10. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating the words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need before you even ask. Pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
This is the Lord's Prayer that goes on when you read the rest of the chapter. But I want to emphasize what Jesus is saying in verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says that we should be praying for what's happening in heaven should be invading in earth. Because there's no sickness in heaven. There's no sorrow in heaven. There's no sadness in heaven. There's no depression in heaven. There's no cancer in heaven. And we should want to live under open heaven. We want to have his peace. We want to have his joy. We want to have health. We want all that to invade the earth. But we shouldn't only focus on the outcome of prayer. Because if you can't get close with God, you will understand what it means to live under the open heaven and experience the outpour of the Holy Spirit. So we need to focus on being close to God in the private, not just going to God when we need something to happen. Private prayer is not for results, it is for relationship. And when we have a relationship, then we learn to move our prayer life from being something that we do only when we have a problem to being something that we do because we love to be in the presence of God, because we rejoice when we're talking to our Father, because we love just to be at His feet. Now, if you're praying to God when you have a problem and you're talking to God about your problems, learn to talk to your problems about your God. So instead of saying, God, I got another problem, you're going to look at that mountain and you're going to say, mountain, move, because you just activated God in my defense. I am a daughter first and I know who I serve. And that's what happens when you have relationship. And that's what happens when you believe in the power of private prayer. So when we talk about private prayer and when we talk about closeness, when we talk about fellowship with God, I want you to ask yourself this question. Does God know me? And you might say, well, he does know me. He created me. But see, now you're answering the question in the form of creation. Ask yourself a question, does God know you? And you might say, well, you know, I believe in the power of prayer, you know, and I come to church and I sing and I lift my hands. But see, now you're answering the question in the form of religion. I'm asking you the question, does God know you in the form of closeness, of fellowship? Because we need to understand that we were made first for relationship with our Father. James 4, 8 says, come near to me and he'll come near to you. I love this. God is like, if you take a step, I'm going to take one. So let's picture it this way. God is stressing out his hand. He is saying, can I have this dance? Can I have this dance? And I'll be leading you. Because see, when he leads us in a sense, we're stepping in, we're moving together with the Lord. That's the kind of closeness the Lord wants to have with you. And he already took the first step when his son Jesus on the when he, his son died on the cross. Now he's saying, "What are you going to do? Because if you come to me, I'm going to come to you. So when you reach out to grab the hand of God, He is leading you in your daily walk. He is leading you in the middle of a storm. He is leading you while you are at work. He is leading you in your marriage. He is leading you in raising your kids. He is leading you to speak to people in the community about His grace, about His mercy, about His love, because we shouldn't be selfish and just keep it to ourselves. We were made to go out there and talk about who our Father is. And I don't know about you, but I want to take steps toward the Lord all the time. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And if people could be taking a smoke break, we could be taking a prayer break, right? Where we're spending time with our Heavenly Father, where we're spending time with the Prince of Peace, where we're spending time with Elohim. But this isn't a one-time thing. This is a daily thing. See, prayer is not optional. And many times you are treating it as an option. Prayer is a necessity. And I know that as human beings, we need closeness with people, but sometimes we try to get that closeness from people that we really should be getting from God. And yes, one of our core values, yes, one of our core values here in V1, it is unity. And we do encourage for you to, you know, do community together, to do life together, or to form friendships. But if you're latching on to people, you need to understand that there is some things that you can't get from people because you should be getting it from God. Now, I'm not saying that this is happening in V1. Don't come at me. Don't come at me, because I know what already is happening. There's a phrase in Spanish, bueno, si te duele. <laughs> and it really happens more in the Spanish community, because y'all be inviting yourself to people's houses and overstaying your visit. 
I'm just kidding. My husband knows what I'm talking. Well, Pastor Jocelyn knows what my husband what my husband does. That he does that. He's the latch. I just tag along. No, just kidding. <laughs> But let me get back to this, because what's happening is that some people want to latch onto a pastor, but a pastor is not God. Some people want to latch to a ministry. Some people want to latch onto their connect group facilitator, and then they'd be like, why haven't they called me? I just called them an hour ago. Some people are like, hey, I posted, and nobody in my connect group posted or liked it or commented on my post. Some people are saying, well, if they would check on me daily, they would know what I'm going through. So why aren't they checking on me daily? But what I'm going to ask you, why are you trying to place a demand on a human being or desiring this closeness that you should be getting from God? I always say people should not be your spiritual crutch. And we still want to encourage community and fellowship in V1. But hence, we're, doing, we're asking you, go through Road Track. That's where you'll find a team. That's where you'll find family. But those relationships won't be what they should be if your relationship with God isn't what it should be first. When we have a close vertical relationship with the Father, we will have blessed and healthy relationships with our peers and with our family. And some of you might be thinking, well, I'm struggling when it comes to my private prayer, like for it to be meaningful, for it to, for it to be revelatory. I want you to take the next minute and ask yourself, well, what's happening in the secret place? In James 4, 3, it says, praying with the wrong motives. God knows our motives. Men look at the outward, but God knows our heart. So when you're going into the secret place and you're asking God for things, ask yourself, what's your motive? God, I need a million dollars. Why? God, I want to be married. Why? God, I, I want to be an influencer on social media. Why? God, I, I, wanna, I want that job. Why? God, I, w I want a, a big house, a big house. Why? God, I want to be a pastor. Why? If you don't have the answers for what you've been asking God, can there be anything in you that's the wrong motive? When we get our motives right, we will have meaningful and revelatory prayers because we're saying it's not about me, but it's about the Lord. We don't want to pray that our will be done. We want to pray that the Father's will be done. And many of, know, many of you know that Last year, I shared my testimony about my mom when she was diagnosed with cancer. And let me tell you, my first response wasn't going into my secret place. I cried. You know that telenovela when you keep crying and you're like crying that ugly Spanish cry? That was me. But crying didn't help. But the moment that I just pressed in his presence and I understood what it is to be living under open heaven, where there's no sickness in heaven. And I'm like, this is not your will, Father. So I'm calling on you, Rafa, to heal my mom. And I'm calling, I'm going to keep pressing in and pressing in and pressing in and pressing in and pressing in. And I won't leave your presence until I know that this is not your will. And let me say that my mom is cancer free. All the glory and honor to God. Something else to reflect on when you're praying is Galatians 6, 9, where it says, never giving up, never becoming weary. Your prayers will be revelatory when you keep pressing in, even when it gets hard. Your prayers will be meaningful when you keep pressing in, even when people are criticizing you and gossiping about you. And you all have heard this phrase, delayed is not denied. So if you're still breathing, you better still be believing. It's learning to wait in the Lord and not about how we want our prayer to be answered and when we want our prayer to be answered. Church, I'm going to give you a homework assignment at 10. Last week they did. I'm going to give it to you again to read about the story of Jacob. And we read in Genesis 28 that Jacob had a spiritual experience. He, is, he had a dream where he saw at the top of the ladder the presence of God and angels ascending and descending. God speaks to Jacob, making promises to him and his descendants. Jacob understood that dream, that it was God's active presence, that it was God's care, that it was God's provision. When Jacob awoke from that dream, he poured oil on a stone that he, had to, that he used to rest his head on. And he said, this is Bethel, the house of God because he was aware of his presence. Then we read on in Genesis 35 that many years went by where Jacob is called back to Bethel, where he had that encounter with God. And then he was called back to Bethel to build an altar. Jacob responding to God's command with obedience. He purified himself and his family. And we find Jacob and his family turning wholeheartedly to God in Bethel. Today, God is calling us back to a place where we first encountered him where we felt a deep love for Him. 
And we want to be where He wants us to be in that secret place, in our private devotion with Him. Church, across all campuses, stand to your feet. God wants us to experience the power of His presence through private prayer. Go back to Bethel, where He will remove the stress because now you are processing with God the deep things in your heart. And after talking it out, you seeing it differently because you just process it with the Prince of Peace. And you're processing things with the one that made you. God can tell you about you. God can tell you exactly what you need to do. So what's your response when you feel the urge to talk? Is it gonna be pick up the phone? Or is it gonna be I'm gonna go on my knees? Because the power of prayer is when you realize that one word from God is better than a million words from men. Go back to Bethel, where he enlarges your capacity to receive more of what he has for you. Go back to Bethel where he gives you the courage to make bold moves and take greater steps of faith. Go back to bless Bethel. Go back to that place where he gives you a greater understanding of your purpose and what he has called you to do. The power of private prayer allows us to experience God in life-changing ways. Today, go back to Bethel and be aware of his presence. Be aware of his presence. Don't let the devil, don't let distractions, the way, don't let the way you think and process things remove you from that place. Place, as you're gonna be reading in Jacob when you're doing your homework assignment, is important. We want to be in the right place. We want to be in the secret place so we can encounter God. Today is a day to get yourself back into that place. And I'm not just referring to the physical, but I'm talking about going back to the place in our minds, in our emotions, spiritually, getting back to that place. Today we're saying, I'm going back to Bethel, to the house of God, to my private prayer. I'm saying, Lord, take it all, take it all, take it all, take it all, because it's about you and it's not about me. I'm saying, Lord, you can have my mind, you can have my thoughts, you can have my heart because I'm going to press in. I'm going to keep pressing in and I'm not going to leave your presence because I want to be the place where you live. Can I see the hands of all the people that are saying, I want to be the place where you live, Jesus. I want to be the place where you live. So Lord, say what you need to say. Don't worry about the person next to you, the person behind you, the person in front of you. This is you and God. And you're saying, Lord, I'm going to keep pressing in in your presence. I'm going to keep pressing in your presence because I want to walk with you. No spirit, but the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to be led by my emotions. I'm not going to be led by any thoughts that are not aligned with you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit at all times. I'm going back to Bethel, the house of God where you live. And Lord, you can have it all because I am yours and I want to be the place where you live. If that is you today, with your hands up, your, I want you to just pray it out to the Lord. I want you to keep pressing in His presence. I want you to know that this is not emotionality that we're doing right now, but this is you and God right now. Online, I want you to start praying wherever you are right now. And I want you to believe that this is for you right now. That this is for you right now. There's something in your belly that's stirring up. If you need to scream and let it out, let it out, let it out, let it out, let it out. Because this is you and God. And keep pressing in, keep pressing in. Come on, church. This is you and God where you're saying, I'm surrendering all. I'm surrendering my mind. I'm surrendering my thoughts. I'm surrendering all because I want more of you and less of me. Come on, church. Come on, church. Keep pressing it. This is about you and God. Come on, church.